serial well, I killer. think David Parker Ray is the, the most well-known one, as well as the West Mesa Bone Collector. Yeah. We don't really have a lot of serial killer activity here um, that, that we know of. <laughs> yeah. That we know of. I know there's a lot of missing and murdered indigenous women on um, tribal mm. lands, and some of those might be attributed to serial killers, but there's really no way to know for sure. Yeah. Um, I know that there are rumors that there is a serial killer operating right now in Albuquerque. How's it going, man? Hey, how are you? Doing well. My name is Cam. I'll be your bartender today. What can I get you? Uh, I'll take a glass of wine and a water. Absolutely. Um, here's the water first off. We have that right Thank away. You. And then for the wine, we have a Sauvignon Blanc. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Let me go get a cup for you then. Glass. What's your name, man? I'm Eric Carter Londine. Nice. You from Albuquerque? I'm originally from Socorro, but I live in Albuquerque now. Gotcha, Socorro. My brother goes to school down there. At Tech? Yeah, at Tech. Or The Tech, if you're from Socorro. <laughs> the Tech. <laughs> do they call it The Tech? They do. That's really funny. It's unfortunate. I know. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Absolutely. Socorro is quite an interesting town. It's got the college, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Did you like growing up in Socorro? Or? Um, Most people don't, so yeah. it's okay to say you don't. Yeah. You know, I liked the, I like the fact that I have lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I just actually hung out with a friend the other day who I've known for 35 years. So yeah. that's cool. Uh, I didn't really like living there, though. It was a little bit tough. Yeah, and there's not there. there's not much to do but go to school and get in trouble. That's right. And party. <laughs> right. Yep, yeah. It's nothing like a tech party. That's right. <laughs> Those parties are insane. <laughs> they are. So you're living in Albuquerque now, right? I live in Albuquerque. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Do you ever live... A, Elsewhere, or you're New Mexican born and raised? New Mexican born and raised. It's oh, yeah. hard to, to leave the chili. It's true. Red or green? Uh, Christmas. Christmas. All right. Yeah. That's pretty good. I'm a, I'm a green guy. I, yeah. like, I like the green a lot. That's cool. So I see the shirt here. Mm -hmm. True Consequences. What's that? That's my uh, True Crime podcast. It focuses on oh. New Mexico and the desert southwest. Wow. Okay. So you talk about like, okay, so true crime being like, Ted Bundy or... Well, it's all focused on New Mexico. Okay. So uh, mostly New Mexico cases. There are some like, you know, I have one in Durango and a couple in Texas and Arizona, just depending on um, whatever case information I have available. But uh, so I don't talk about Ted Bundy because he was yeah. never he was never here. He's a Utah boy. But I have talked about David Parker Ray, who is the most prolific serial rapist and presumed serial killer in New Mexico history. Tell me about him, because I've never heard of this guy. Uh, it's a really messed up story. Okay. So this guy lived in Elephant Butte Lake, mm -hmm. like in the area of the little town outside of the lake. He worked for the State Parks Department. He was a ranger, and he would often come to Albuquerque or other parts of New Mexico and abduct women. He would uh, hold them captive and torture them, rape them repeatedly, and uh, it is assumed that he killed many of them, but they've never found a body or associated any bodies that they have found to him okay yeah wow it's a crazy story yeah because i knew growing up my dad would always tell me that butte it's such a nasty lake and there's always dead bodies and cars and everything lying in that lake yeah but now there's like an active there was there was an active serial killer wow yeah, yeah. and so like the fbi if you go on their website and you look for david parker ray there is a, a bunch of information about what when he was active and there's a lot of photos of trophies that they they um took in during the evidence collection process. Mm -hmm. And so if people are looking for loved ones that were missing in the late 90s, early 90s, they can look at all of that and see if maybe it might be somebody that they know. Yeah, so how do you do research on these then? Like, are you, because when I think of true crime, normally that's some serious journalism, right? Yeah. That's going in, that's speaking to family members, that's, yeah. uh, how do you go about doing that and making those contacts? Yeah, so uh, it just depends on the case. Some family members are willing to talk, some family members are not, and I respect their wishes yeah. you know, either way because it is a personal decision to make. Uh, I do rely a lot on public records, so I'll put in a public records request and I'll get police reports, uh, interviews, video and audio, uh, just a bunch of information from the police as well as records from the courts. 
Okay. Gotcha. And that's typically how I do my research. Have you done any investigations on the uh, West Mesa murders? I, I did one episode on it, but it wasn't really a deep dive. It was early on when I had just started. Yeah. Um, I probably want to go back and revisit that. Absolutely. Because yeah. that's, that's the biggest one here in Albuquerque, yeah. right? That's the yeah. one everyone thinks of. And, and honestly, I think law enforcement believe that it's not just one person responsible for all of those murders. It was probably multiple people. Uh, that is... What, what, from what I understand, the most recent theory that they're going with, it's okay. multiple people probably in power. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's cool. I mean, that's not cool, but that's interesting. You know what I mean? It that's, is, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what would be like the most... So you talked about the most prolific serial killer. What's like a serial killer that you covered that's pretty like, let's say... I don't want to say famous because we don't want to get famed with these people, but um, well-known serial well, I think killer. David Parker Ray is the, the most well-known one, as well as the West Mesa Bone Collector. Yeah. We don't really have a lot of serial killer activity here um, that, that, we know of, <laughs> yeah. that we know of. I know there's a lot of missing and murdered indigenous women on um, mm. tribal lands, and some of those might be attributed to serial killers, but there's really no way to know for sure. Yeah. Um, I know that there are rumors that there is a serial killer operating right now in Albuquerque. Yeah, um, over there near the mall area, right? Street Safe New Mexico has a lot of information on their website that talks about uh, somebody who they suspect is potentially a uh, serial killer operating right now. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Do you work a lot with these organizations? Like Street uh, Safe and all that? I, I don't work directly with them, but I always encourage my listeners to donate to organizations like that. Yeah. Um, like the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, those things are, are very important to me. Absolutely. Yeah. So how successful is your podcast then? Like, because <laughs> you have you have merch here, yeah. right? But to me, that that's a sign of something. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty successful. I just hit 500,000 downloads. Whoa. Um, I think it was last week. And... I've got, yeah, it's, it's been insane. I've been on every news channel. I've been in the newspaper. Um, I was in the Las Cruces newspaper. So it's, it's been pretty successful. Wow. It's been That's good. really cool. Yeah. That's super cool. And that's because true crime podcast, like true crime is a genre that's very prolific in, mm-hmm. in, in people. So to be noticed out of all that's very impressive. It's cool. Yeah. There's thousands and thousands of shows. So yeah. it, it really means a lot to me that my listeners are yeah. are there and listening to me. So what's unique about you that you bring to the table that you think gets people to, to listen? I think part of it's your ge- ge- geographic location of yeah. how you're focusing on New Mexico and no one focuses on New Mexico that often, which is sad because I right. love New Mexico. Right. But that's, that's probably part of it. But why else do you think? Well, I have a, a personal connection to true crime. My brother was murdered 35 years ago. Oh. Um, his killer was never brought to justice. And so the show actually was created out of... Uh, a desire to honor him and his life. I wasn't really wanting to talk about it at first because I'm a pretty private person. Yeah. I don't like putting all my information out on the internet, but uh, in order to get justice, you know, I was willing to do pretty much anything. And so I did cover his case on my show in season two. Um, I approached true crime different than a lot of what I would call status quo shows. Yeah. In the sense that I'm very empathetic. Like, I understand what it's like to fight for justice. I understand what it's like to feel, like, forgotten by the New Mexican justice system. Um, And so I provide that lens when I'm looking at true crime. It's always from the victim's angle and from the families that are left behind. And I try to be as fact-based as possible. I rely a lot on public information records Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, I try not to speculate as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's hard, uh, but I do try to keep it very fact-based and very, and very unbiased victim focus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that probably brings a really fresh lens into it. Cause I think about like some of the true crime things that I want. Like there's this recent one that's coming out. It's called under the banner of heaven. Have you mm. seen that one? Not yet. It's on, it's on, it's got Andrew Garfield playing on it and it's, um, it's, it's about, I used to be Mormon, right? Mm. And so it's about the serial killers up in Utah who were fundamentalists who were killing based upon fundamentalist Mormon beliefs. And it comes at a very harsh bias sure. against that religion. And it lends, it takes away some of the credibility of it, unfortunately, which I don't, because like what they're saying is true and it was the religion that was playing a factor into it. However, it did take that harsh bias and so mm-hmm. people stopped watching it. Yeah. Well, and especially if you're counting on people in the LDS community to yeah. watch it, like they're not going to want to watch it if that's how you're approaching it, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then you lost out on all that viewership that could have potentially watched and learned from it. Sure. Because I don't know, you should never, what am I trying to say here? I don't know. Like 
they call it like bashing, right? Like yelling at people and getting the, yeah. it doesn't work. It right. really doesn't. So if you want people to change their, their mindset on it, you got to do something like that. I, I do. And I try to be very neutral about things. I, yeah. I do. I get passionate about things like child abuse. You know, that's my brother was killed from child abuse. And so, mm -hmm. and, and I grew up in a home that was very abusive. So, you know, I get passionate about that. And sometimes I will get, um, a little bit intense, yeah. uh, especially as it pertains to the laws that I think that need to change and, and the way that things shake out here. So New Mexico's laws, right? Yeah. What, what flaws do you find in them? And <laughs> cause there's probably several, there's right? a lot, Yeah. Uh, well, I think this may not be unique to New Mexico, but you know, one of the things that came up with my brother's case is the killer confessed he failed the polygraph exam. Uh, there was a lot of evidence early on in the investigation that proved that he was responsible for my brother's death. And because of a number of factors, the prosecutor decided not to prosecute. And that is well within every prosecutor's right, which is something that was shocking to me to learn, is so if a prosecutor receives a case on their desk, they look at it, they feel like they can't win it, or they don't want to prosecute it because it's too difficult, they fully have the prerogative to not prosecute based on those. But they really don't have to give a reason why. Yeah, they just don't want to. And so I think that in cases mm -hmm. like child abuse and mm -hmm. um, first degree murder, I, I don't think that there should be an option for prosecutors. I think they should be required to, if it meets a certain burden of proof, uh, they should be required to prosecute those cases, even if they seem unwinnable. Yeah. Wouldn't just a new prosecutor take it up or... Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They can put it into an inactive status and it can just sit there until somebody decides to pick it up, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody will. That seems extraordinarily fucked up. Well, the problem is, is that that office and the administration in that office is, you know, that office is an elected position. So yeah. uh, the only way really to get people to care is to make it unpopular politically for them to not prosecute, which is why I created all this awareness around my brother's case. Yeah. So has the awareness around the case brought prosecution or? Uh, the case is reopened for the first time in 35 years. It wow. was reopened last year. It's being investigated actively right now. Um, I can't talk much more about that, yeah, no, but absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it worked. <coughs> you know, that kind of pressure and that awareness does create um, a sense of unfavorability if you mm -hmm. don't move forward politically. So without that political pressure, mm -hmm. would change ever occur? Uh, maybe if you had the right person in the office that cared. I mean, it's just a humanitarian, which how many politicians are... Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Like that. Uh, the other issues we face, you know, the um, Arnold tool, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -mm. So this is going to be a little bit dry, but essentially we voted in the early 2000s to get, away, get rid of bail. Okay. And... That was all done under the guise of limiting overcrowding in, in the jails. Okay. Okay. And every time New Mexico tries to limit overcrowding in the jails, it always ends up being a disaster for us in okay. terms of crime. So what happens is they, they always will pro promise that they're only going to release people uh, pending sentencing who are nonviolent or, you know, don't have weapons associated with whatever charge they were charged with. And that sounds great. But it doesn't always work. And yeah. you see a lot of violent offenders being released pending sentencing, then they go out and reoffend, then they get arrested again, then they get released again. It's kind of like a back and forth thing. And so um, when there's no real penalties for things like armed robbery or mm -hmm. carjacking or mugging people, um, and you're just gonna go home with an ankle bracelet, it really doesn't mm -hmm. dissuade people from doing that, right? Yeah. Like they just continue to do it. And so, um, that's the law I'd really like to see overturned. I'd like to see us go back to something a little bit more sensible. Yeah. I never even heard of that because I'm, I'm 24. Mm -hmm. So in the early two thousands, I would have been four or five years old. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, but that's, man, that is, that's, that's harsh. It's frustrating. Yeah. It's frustrating. And, and the other problem we have in New Mexico, it doesn't have to do with the laws, but you know, we're one of the poorest states. We have some of the lowest uh, stats in education. Mm -hmm. And um, when you couple that with a high incident rate of child abuse and domestic violence, you're going to see people turn to drugs to yeah. deal with those traumas. And when they turn to drugs, then crime becomes a problem. And so you can't really deal with crime just through legislation. You have to address those other underlying yeah. issues that are contributing because crime is just a symptom of some larger problems Absolutely. that we have. So you need to reinvest in the community. you got to reinvest right. in park system, education system, um, art, community events. Right. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's something super big. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I learned a I learned something from a friend the other day of how New Mexico actually isn't that poor of a state. In fact, we receive lots of funding and lots of money from things like oil uh, and net renewable resources and, gar and the federal government. It's loads of cash from them, but it doesn't trickle down right. appropriately into the community, making us one of the poorest states in America. Yeah, and when I when I talk about poverty, it's not it's not necessarily in relation to the state government. No, the yeah, state yeah. government does have enough money to operate their their administration yeah. and everything that they have to do but you have a lot of people who are living significantly below the poverty line mm -hmm. here a good percentage like probably 60 70 percent of the population in the state is below the poverty line yeah you can't really expect crime to not be an issue when that's the case yeah absolutely poverty unfortunately leads to higher rates of crime mm -hmm. and that that for a lot of different reasons yeah. mostly because the support just isn't offered to those right. families right holy cow yeah no that's that's sad. That's super sad. So, what are some things that New Mexico has going for it? Like, because these are some those are some fucked up laws. <laughs> those are sad. Yeah. So, what are some things that we have going for us? Like, one thing, right? We got rid of qualified immunity. I think that's a great thing. Yeah, that's um, a good thing. That that prevents um, that enables families to sue bad cops, which mm -hmm. normally police the poor. And right, there's there's some troubles with that. There can be absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What we have going for us, I would say, probably. We've got great views. <laughs> <laughs> they have that new, uh, um, Tim Keller, the mayor did that new, um, what is it called? Fuck. Um, the homeless specialist division that assists cops. So instead of, if there's like oh, a, yeah, yeah. a homeless person, I think that's a, is, yeah. The, yeah. They'll bring mental health professionals. If it's like a, a, men, a mental health issue that somebody's dealing with, I think that's mm. really smart. I think that's great. Um, that we have that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, <laughs> the rest of the, the legislation system is really geared towards um, supporting the accused. And while I'm all about everybody having their constitutional rights. And it's until proven guilty. The, the victims and the victims' families really get left behind here in New Mexico. And so um, I know I talk a lot about what's wrong, but it's yeah. only because I love this state so much that I want it to be better Absolutely. and I know that it can be. So would you consider your show more than just true crime or even political activism? I would say it's more advocacy driven, okay. but yeah. Um, maybe activism. I, I, I like to think of it more as advocacy because I really want to advocate for things to change okay. and advocate for family members who are seeking justice. So, so how do you choose a pro project to work on a, a case to, to cover and to document? Are they always going to be open cases? Are they sometimes um, closed cases or cold cases? I do all of those things. It really depends on the case itself. So in my mind, when I approach my show, mm -hmm. I'm primarily focusing on helping family members who are seeking justice in an unsolved case. Um, that's my primary focus. Yeah. Secondarily, I'll pick a case that's been closed if it helps tell the story of why New Mexico is the way that it is or why our laws are the way that they are uh, or to illustrate and emphasize the point of why our laws are problems. Yeah. And, and then the third part is I like to throw in every now and then a case that's just interesting to me. Uh, so I'll talk about some of the things that interest me, like Billy the Kid, yeah. um, cults, which is not necessarily true crime. It's kind of true crime adjacent, yeah. um, but that stuff always fascinates me. So every now and then I like to break up the, the sadness and throw in something that I just am interested in. Have you ever seen Billy the Kid's grave out in Fort Sumner? I did. That's, that's, the only, that's the only thing that's there. But yeah. it's cool. <laughs> it's There's, an cool. There. There's an all-subs there. There's an all-subs. It's all sick. <laughs> we could get a chimney real fast. <laughs> oh, man. So what um, what field were you in before this? Do you have any like training in this? Like, Do you have a degree in, in something? I have, I have an Jason? MBA. <laughs> so no. So accounting then? Uh, no, business. Business, yeah. Business in general. Um, I've always been in, in the business world it just kind of happened by accident, honestly. Mm. I, I kind of saw these cases coming through the justice system, cases like Victoria Martins, Omar Varela, Jeremiah Valencia, a lot of these child murder cases. And I kept saying to myself that somebody should say something about this because, you know, with my brother's story, it's kind of been a long line of, of something similar happening here in New Mexico. And we really have never done a good job of dealing with child abuse. It's just yeah. never been something that we've been good at. Um, and then I think a lot of states struggle with it as well. You know, Child Protective Services is always underfunded and overworked uh, in every state. Yeah, it's, 
it's 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 real bad here too because I I have to be real careful what I say yeah for right now but in my day job I work with autistic children yeah that's what I do and so hip is a thing so I'd be very careful sure. what I say however I have noticed that CPS and child protective services as a whole the, the industry um, again overworked mm-hmm. underpaid underfunded mm-hmm. and unfortunately um, if you're on Medicaid doesn't happen as fast as it needs to be yeah and so poor communities suffer and have no fix when because i'm a mandatory reporter right i have to call every case that i see that is even the thought of abuse i call right Mm -hmm. and those who are on medicaid uh, it doesn't get dealt with in a timely fashion and that can cause some serious issues whereas if i have someone on private insurance next day they're there right the next hour they're there and so it's a system that almost penalizes the poor just for being poor it does and the resources that are left uh, that are available for kids who have been traumatized in in that way they're very slim and they're very difficult to find and access and they're sad like if a child does go into an emergency foster system right they'll be at cps for 24 hours and the rooms that they have they're waiting in are, are like fema disaster mm-hmm. camp rooms mm-hmm. and they're just cots yeah but we don't deal with the mental health consequences of it absolutely not. at all and so the, those are all the things that kind of led me to this aha moment where i said well i guess i could say something about this yeah and then i at the time i was really listening to a lot of true crime podcasts and i thought well i could do that um a little did i know that it was going to be very difficult <laughs> uh, but i've i've kind of learned the hard way as i usually do uh, how to make how to make my podcast yeah so, so how how because this is a tough one. Like it, here at the bar, right? I have someone here every Sunday, mm-hmm. right? Easy enough. How do you keep regular content pushing out like that when this is some basically investigative journalism where it takes time to get the case recommendations and to interview the families? Mm-hmm. How do you, how how long does it take to make an episode? Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> from start to finish, it's probably over a hundred hours per episode. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's from research to a finished product to like edited cut mm-hmm. good to go mm-hmm. pop it on youtube um do you find that you're putting them out like probably like once a month or once a week one whoa so how do you keep that going then how do you keep that momentum when that's such that's 100 hours it's a lot yeah um work really f- hard to be ahead yeah mostly um so right now i'm about six weeks ahead of production okay yeah that's that's smart <laughs> that's the only way i can do it yeah and i also have a full-time job you know this is this is my kind of side hustle situation so wow so what do you do full-time then you're still in the business world i assume yeah okay uh, yeah i'm just gonna leave it that <laughs> not fair enough no fair <laughs> enough <laughs> that's cool um so outside of podcasting mm-hmm. business world mm-hmm. what do you like to do oh man i like to travel yeah travel's a lot of fun um did a lot more of it before COVID. Starting to do more of it now. It's fair. Yeah. Do, what are some cool places you've seen maybe inside the U.S. and outside of the U.S.? Uh, well, one of my favorite things to do is go to national parks. I just, yeah. I love going to national parks. So uh, last year I went to the Chiricahua National Monument, which is these really cool rock formations that were mm-hmm. created by like wind erosion. Really, really cool place. Um, and then outside the country, my favorite place was Greece. That's cool. It was amazing. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Have you ever been to Glacier National Park? Not yet. I used to live like 15 minutes down the canyon from it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Tough in the winter. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> gorgeous, though. They don't, they don't even finish plowing all the... Because they had like the going to the sun road to get up there. And they don't finish plowing it until like mid-July. And there's like 30-foot drifts and everything up there. Oh, wow. And like you have to like... It's insane. And then by August, like maybe all the snows met, melted, maybe. And then, and then it's back in October. Yep. yep, yep <laughs> immediately got the snows back there. Wow. That sounds yeah. cool. I, I actually want to go there. I have a, a journal of national parks that I want to visit. So, mm-hmm. Do you drive there or fly there? or what do you like? It to depends do? on how far it is. Yeah. yeah. If I can drive within like six hours, I'll probably drive. That's fair. We have a lot of cool national parks mm-hmm. in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, White Sands. White Sands, Valles Caderes. Uh, Tent Rocks. Mm-hmm. Carlsbad um, Caverns. Yeah, Carlsbad. Um, all kinds El Mal Pais. Of, yep, they're the Lava Caves. Mm-hmm. I don't the know Valley of Fire. Yep, yep, yep. The yeah. Ice Caves and Grants. There's so Those much. Those are so cool. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, there's so much. And people look kind of like down on New Mexico a lot, but this place is sick. This place is cool. I love New Mexico. It's really cool. And mm-hmm. 
I always want to tell people that want to move here that it's terrible. It's full of crime. You don't want to move here. It's very expensive. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Do not come. Do, don't move here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because people talk about like the crime rates in like Albuquerque, yeah. right? It's mostly perpetuated by automotive crime. Yeah. And on top of that, look at Detroit, mm -hmm. Chicago, LA, New York. Yeah. But it's per just, capita, it, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty intense per it's, capita. It's up there. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a safer than those places mm -hmm. because it's still still kind of small. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's the nice part about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Oof. So, coming to a bar, mm -hmm. you order wine. Yeah. Right. Are you a wine guy? Do you like other drinks? I like other drinks. Uh, okay. I like craft beer. I like tequila. So what is what is craft beer? Because I've always heard that. Like, what does that mean? Mostly beer? like local breweries. Local so breweries. they're they're doing small batches. And okay, you what's, what's your favorite local brew? Oh man, I have a lot of them. Um, let me think. Marble's always a good go to for me, and yeah. I like their Desert Fog. Um, I like Bosque Brewing's Open Space. I'm I'm a basic guy. Like I like That's the fair. IPAs, you know. That's I fair. just I like. I'm like stuff. a wheat ale kind of guy. So I really like differential down the road, uh -huh. and then I really like uh, Alien Brew Pub. I like Sidetrack. Sidetrack side is a lot of fun. Great. Yeah, it's a good one. I think they have Base Camp IPA that I like. So. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah, that is really good. I think that we have a lot of unique brews here. It's just it's just real interesting culture mm -hmm. around drinking. Is it always a good culture around drinking? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's a very very interesting culture. Definitely. What part of Albuquerque living would you consider to be your favorite part? And what part would you consider to be the difficult, least favorite part of, of living here in Albuquerque? Okay. I have a lot of favorite parts. All right. You can list as many as you want. <laughs> uh, the food is just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can't get food like this anywhere else. You move else. away from here because I've done it a couple yeah, times. And it's, it's not the same. Nope. Come it's back. It's not the same. <laughs> uh, so I love our food. I love the culture. I love the diversity of culture that we have mm -hmm. here from, you know, the old time Spanish settlers to the uh, 19 Pueblos that we have here in the different reservations. It's just, it's just a beautiful melting pot of different cultures. The art, uh, all of it is just so incredible. Like I said, the views and, and the scenery here mm. is unbeatable. I, I don't yeah. think I've found a state that is as breathtaking as New Give Mexico. Give me a better sunset than a New Mexico sunset. Right. You can't. Right. Yeah. So uh, least favorite, obviously crime is, yeah. is, is up there. I think um, that's probably the the least favorite thing I have yeah. about New Mexico. But otherwise, I, I love it here. Mm -hmm. And it's affordable, which is also awesome. <laughs> yes, it is extraordinarily affordable <laughs> yeah. comparatively. Yeah, no, absolutely. With your podcast, mm -hmm. right, New Mexico's home base. Right. Do you have a viewership outside of New Mexico? I do, yeah. I have a viewership in several countries around the world. So it's been it's been a little interesting to watch all these people you know, listening all around the world to mm -hmm. these stories from New Mexico. It gives me a sense of, of pride in, in our state and, and it makes me happy to know that people are interested in what's going on here. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you ever travel and promote your show outside of New Mexico in different in states? Yeah, I, uh, I did a tour in Colorado. Oh, wow. Um, I'm doing one in Texas, in California, Chicago. I'm trying to hit as many places as yeah. I can. Promote yeah. it. Yeah. Um, what does that tour look like? What do, what do you do? So it's typically about two hours long. Mm -hmm. um, I usually will cover a case that's a little bit more lighthearted than I normally would just because sometimes people are there for a date night. They want to have a good time. They don't necessarily want to be bummed out with like a really sad case. Yeah. So um, I try to talk about kind of what I'm working on right now, uh, what's coming up in the future, and then I'll give a short case uh, or two depending on, on the night. And then I'll do a little bit of Q&A and a meet and greet. So it's pretty pretty low-key oh yeah that's yeah. super cool where do you conduct these types of shows at typically in breweries wineries places like that just because they're more intimate and um the food and drink is provided and yeah. i don't have to worry about that that's fair yeah do you what type of person listens to your podcast like what's your like stereotypical listener is there is there like a demographic that you yeah look hard to is there one that you are still looking to capture but haven't fit quite figured it out yet well true crime is is historically very female okay. skewed so my listenership is about 80 percent 84 percent female wow <laughs> and and the majority of them are between 25 and 55 okay that's kind of the sweet spot for true crime in general okay so female base 25 to 55 mm -hmm. is there like a surprising like demographic that you seem to cat where you're like oh i didn't think 
they listen to it. Well, I think just people in other countries yeah. is, is the thing that surprises me the most. You know, like I'm often charting in like Suriname and Belgium and really? the Netherlands and all these places that is like, oh, you know, I think probably a good number of those listens are, are military people that are yeah. living abroad, um, maybe from New Mexico. So that's kind of cool to know that they're listening as well. That's kind of crazy. Just mm-hmm. randomly, if someone in Belgium is like, oh, hey, I'm going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Have you ever heard of, I think you might have covered in one of your episodes, actually, the um, Toy Box Killer? Yep. Okay. I don't know a lot about him. Can you tell me about him? Oh, we talked about it. Was that the guy? Yeah, David Parker. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. You didn't say Toy Box, and I was like, that sounds like the Toy Box Killer. It, it, was, a, it was a Toy Box Killer. Absolutely. Sorry about so that. So was he ever brought to justice? Or? Uh, so he was arrested. Okay, so yeah, so Cynthia Vigil Jaramillo was one of his victims. She yeah. was a sex worker living in Albuquerque. Um, interestingly enough, she told me that her mom was murdered by a serial killer named mm-hmm. Samuel Little. Um, I haven't been able to corroborate that or verify that, but that was something she told me in the interview that I did with her. She escaped him. Uh, she was one of the only people to escape him. And um, because of that, she was able to get the police to his place mm-hmm. before he even knew what was happening. And he was arrested. Um, he was charged with abduction, you know, kidnapping, rape, a bunch of other things. They didn't really charge him with murder because there was no, like I said, bodies yeah. to attribute to him. But um, while he was getting ready to go in for sentence or for uh, the trial, he actually died of a heart attack. Uh, so he was never technically brought to justice, but I did talk to Cynthia about that. And she said that she was fine. <laughs> that yeah. he was, it was fine that he was dead. So that he couldn't really hurt anybody else anymore. And that's really what mattered. So absolutely. Yeah. So there's a critique that, um, a lot of people within true crime get of bringing fame to bad people, mm-hmm. right? Cause the people who were doing this, we were talking about names of people. Yeah. It's almost like they've gained stardom from sure. their evil acts. Yeah. What's your opinion on when people say that? Is it truthful? Is there some truth in it? Is it bogus? Yeah. There's a, there's a whole subculture of people that kind of fetishize, uh, serial killers mm-hmm. and murderers. Um, you know, you, you see people talking about how they think Ted Bundy's hot, hot or, mm-hmm. um, you know, you just hear that kind of stuff all the time. And, yeah. and that really, bothers me for a number of reasons um the the biggest is like first of all this person is a disgusting vile example of what a human being is um and so to to give that any kind of credence you know no matter what they look like the second i find out that you're a murderer like you're no longer hot in my opinion right yeah you're instantly just you're just like an evil awful person yeah uh so that kind of subculture is there there's also this kind of murderbilia culture that happens in true Mm. crime that I don't really necessarily agree with. I think that true crime is due for uh, a change. And if Mm. you look at my Twitter feed, you'll see that I'm constantly talking about it. Um, I think that we could do a lot better as an industry at being victim focused and empathetic and Mm. fact based and not speculative and not sensationalized. All of those things are what I consider to be Uh, part of the problem that leads to this kind of fetishization Mm -hmm. process. And so you'll see a lot of times I'll, I'll name the victim. There are some cases where I do name uh, the suspect in the title of the episode, but for the most part, I try to be very victim focused. And if it's victim focused, it loses that um, fetishization of of the serial killer. Well, you can't deny that it's a horrible tragedy. I think that's the thing that people forget about true crime is you're talking about the worst day in somebody's in in somebody's life. It's, it's real. It's not a movie, you know, it's it's not, not it's not fake. And so that needs to be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. There's this whole subculture that has to do with like mass shootings of, of people very similar to fetishizing, like, uh, the people who did Columbine, right? And there's a whole Instagram sub chain of people talking about how hot they are. And yeah. it's, it's sad because imagine being the family member of someone who was murdered by that person mm-hmm. and then they're giving praises to them. That's it's, it's actually disgusting. a mental health, um, disorder. It could be diagnosed yeah. by, uh, the DSM. I'm not a mental health professional, yeah. but there, there is a specific disorder that comes with that whole, what's the disorder called? Uh, hybristophilia. Hyperstophilia, mm-hmm. which is kind of a sexual obsession with somebody who is a murderer. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that's like a diagnosable uh-huh. thing then. Is there, I feel like that's probably not diagnosed that often. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's something that isn't quite at the forefront of, of everything yet. Yeah. Wow. It's, 
And we're talking a lot about fucked up things today. <laughs> Welcome to my life. I know. <laughs> That's all I do all the time. That's fair. So you just does that is that hard for you? Is yeah. it hard for you to talk about those, those those very depressing things? Yeah, absolutely. How do you cope with that? Uh, well, I'm in therapy. Okay, so good. that helps a lot. Um, I also try to pace myself. You mm-hmm. know, if I'm not feeling it, I won't force myself to record an episode or research. If I need a break from it, I take a break. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also think that the part of helping other people kind of helps soften that. For me, it makes me a little bit less worried about what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and more focused on how I can help these people that need help. Absolutely. So it's more um, service-based instead yeah. of getting into the nitty-gritty gritty details of exactly. everything. That's fair. I can, I can see that. I could see that wearing down on somebody, just constantly consuming that form of media. Yeah. Like if you look at um, uh, detective agents who are constantly viewing uh, child abuse cases, mm-hmm. that, that wears on, on folks a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's fair. I feel like anyone who consumes that form of media, it should be like a mandatory uh, therapy, like a program involved with the industry. I think everyone should see a therapist, but specifically. I agree. Yeah. I think it's really important for everybody. Um, it's helped, it saved my life, honestly. Yeah. Therapy. So with therapy then, how hard is it for communities in New Mexico to access ther- therapy? It can be extremely difficult. Uh, you know, Medicaid providers, as you can imagine, are overworked. Mm-hmm. Um, their calendars are always full, so it can be difficult to find somebody in a reasonable amount of time. Um, it's even difficult for me, and I have private insurance. You know, mm-hmm. I, It took me a long time to find my therapist and find somebody that I can work with and gel with that um, can meet my needs. So it, I think access is important here, and I think that we are underserved. Yeah. I feel like therapy isn't a come back in a week type dealio thing. No. It should be a, can I get in tomorrow? Because you never know someone's mental state. You never know. Yeah. And even to a certain degree, like our practices on suicide prevention, mm-hmm. right? Again, overworked and un- under underfunded. Yeah. Like there was a point in my life where I had to call the hotline mm-hmm. and I stood on, on hold for six minutes in a parking lot trying to get some help. And I just, I was thinking to myself, I was like, if I was any worse or if I was someone who was actually like, really really like about to do something i'd be dead Mm -hmm. because i had to be on hold for six minutes yeah and then eventually they direct me to the right hospital to go to i go there but because i'm already de-escalated i come in they say come back when you're escalated and they charge me 150 bucks copay for five minutes of their time right so then now that tells me i can never go to a hospital again because i can't afford that shit right so mental health in america but specifically new mexico is just so brutal it is it is and i think in in the united states in general we just don't do a good job of mm-hmm. of dealing with it um, there's still a tremendous amount of stigma around mental health issues uh, it's very difficult especially for men to yeah. talk about about those issues um, and there's just really not a lot of support as a community we don't have a lot of support mm-hmm. Um, and you look at other countries they do things very differently here in in the u.s we a lot of times family members will just abandon their family when Mm -hmm. they start to exhibit mental health challenges. And then you see a high incidence of homelessness. Mm -hmm. You look at a country like India, where what happens when somebody's diagnosed with some mental health concerns is the whole family rallies around them. They bring them into the home. They take care of them. They feed them. They clothe them. They make sure that they have their medication. It's a completely different mindset when it comes to dealing with mental health. It's like as as if somebody was ill, which... Is what is happening. So now uh, a devil's advocate would mm-hmm. come in and they would say, America is different though. We are of a different system. We're much bigger than those other countries. We, we're geographically huge. Well, so is India. <laughs> but but yeah. yeah, I hear what you're saying. Uh, it's a cultural thing. It's not about money. It's not about politics. This is about our culture as a society. Mm-hmm. We're very uh, self-absorbed and self-centered. Yeah. As a, as a culture. Our culture in America is very toxic in the sense that human beings, human rights have become politicized. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the danger because if you, if you go to another, let's talk about other countries like Sweden, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Switzerland, uh, Australia, Britain, Canada, like all these different countries, uh, what are they talking about in the, and as politicians they are talking about, um, economics, they're talking about. Uh, currency, they're talking about postage, they're talking about military. Those are political things. Mm-hmm. Here. here in America, we're talking about 
mental health or right. people still talking about the right to be married if you're gay right. or abortion. Abortion or, rights, yeah. Why the fuck are we even talking? That's not politics. Those are, that's human right. That's human beings. Right. I'm all down to debate economics. Sure. And if, if you're conservative economically, fuck, I don't care. Great. Yeah, yeah. let's talk. That We can discuss that. We can debate on that. We can't debate on human rights. Right. And that's why I think culture's got to change in America. It's yeah. sad. <laughs> I'm a big fan of just minding your own business. Yep. <laughs> that's kind of my go-to stance politically. Yeah. Um, until, you know, when it comes to justice and things like that, I do get involved. I try not to be too super political on my show, but mm -hmm. the things I do talk about can be political sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? So is there anything you would say? Because you're not on your show, right? You're in my bar. <laughs> okay. What are some things that you wish you could say on your show, but you can't, that you can say here? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that I think we need to evaluate who we're arresting, right? Okay. So we just legalized weed. Yes. We just legalized marijuana. God bless, right? Um, we really probably should be releasing those people who were arrested for that, right? 100%. Um, because that is a big part of the overcrowding that we're facing, right? So we can have space for people who are actual dangers to mm -hmm. our society and to the health and well-being of the community. Uh, I think that those are things that are, are super important. I don't really necessarily talk about that on my show. Um, it's a bit of a side issue, but it is related. It is Absolutely. connected to that. So, Especially when we have people in prison, lives ruined for something right. that's now legal and I can go buy on the corner right. today for like 10 bucks. Right. Um, yeah, that I agree. And I think the reason that isn't happening is because the privatization of uh, prison systems, mm -hmm. mostly. I mean, why in the world was even privatized to begin with? I understand it's because of finances, because it was cheaper for the state to run, but then right. that caused such an issue. I'm just learning that really if you can make something politically unpopular, then it'll change. But until then, people don't have a real Shot incentive or motivation to do it. So how do you make it politically, politically unpopular? You talk about it. Just you, you talk constantly. about it constantly. You talk about it. You talk to everybody about it. You try to educate as many people about it so that they're aware and then they start calling their representatives or they vote for the people that align with the way they feel about those issues. Absolutely. Um, New Mexico is one of those states that can be a little bit difficult to nail down where somebody actually stands in, in our mm -hmm. legislature as it pertains to different things right so uh you may hear something that seems like they align with you but they may you know their record may show something Absolutely. differently and so um i try to as much as i can educate people about that kind of stuff you know Absolutely. how to find out how your representatives are voting there's a site it's called um politic something um ballot.gov or something mm -hmm. like that and it lists all the candidates coming up and how to vote and especially with you know voting restrictions being so prominent within the united states lately mm -hmm. um it's super important for people to understand how to vote yeah. where to vote and yeah. who to vote for that aligns with your, your your political bias and preference right um that's fair though so just constantly talking about these social issues mm -hmm. so that means you know protests and everything like yeah. that are, are super crucial to the, the political system. Protests, petitions, all of those things, you know, getting on the news to talk about those issues are, is really important. If you're passionate about it, that's the only way you're going to get things to change because uh, you have to get people to care. Mm -hmm. And until then, the representatives won't care. So what are your thoughts then about protests that go uh, to, to a, it's not even an extreme, but go to, to another level where they're uh, committing property destruction. We're talking about like bulls on parade style where pigs are, you know, flinging gas and mm -hmm. everything like that. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the verbiage that they would use. Mm -hmm. Um, what is your opinion on those types of, of protests? I think that it really depends on the situation. Okay. Because um, I always cite stuff like, okay, the Newsies, right? Have you seen that musical, Newsies yeah. with Christian Bale? These are, we, we, we hail these kids as heroes because they push forward anti-legislation um, anti against child labor, mm -hmm. right? But in order to do that, they had to beat up people in the street, yeah. tip over carts, you set look buildings at on fire. You Stonewall. look at Stonewall, the Stonewall riot. You know, yeah. Those are a, a lot of things can get the attention not many things can get the attention of people in power like that kind of yeah, demonstration like um i'm not a big fan of violence in in general uh, so i would prefer a peaceful demonstration but i think that sometimes it may take that to get people's attention um again i don't condone doing that kind of stuff yeah violence is, is on 
you know, Wrong. a personal level. Yeah. Um, but I can sometimes sympathize and understand why people would resort to that out of frustration, um, out of anger and out of the feeling of not being heard. Absolutely. I think that's a, it's a crucial part to, to, to really demonstrate how far things are getting. Because if you try, like Black Lives Matter, right? And they tried peaceful, peaceful protesting. They knelt during the national anthem and then they all got fucking fired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, they protested in the streets and then the cops went on them. Right. So the last step, the, the logical last step is burning down target, right. rioting, right. like it's the logical thing here. Yeah. And it wasn't until he got to that point that anything fucking happened. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just hard. I think it's hard to, to break through the noise in, in this mm. modern time. You know, there's so much noise. Everybody's bombarded with media constantly. So you have to find a way to break through sometimes. Absolutely. So with what you're covering in the, 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 the media that you cover, um, you have a family, right? Mm-hmm. How does your family support you uh, through, through making all this? Because I noticed that you made, I saw the rings, so that's why I asked. Yeah. Um, yeah, my family is very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, you know, I think there is some fear from some family members about my safety because of the things I talk about. Retaliation. Yeah, but... Um, they're they're very supportive mm-hmm. and and I couldn't I couldn't be happier with, with the support I get from my family. Can I get you some more wine? I noticed. No, oh, yeah, sure. Oh, I'll perfect. take another glass. Absolutely. Let me get you some more. We have a full bottle, so. <laughs> well, I probably won't drink the full bottle. <laughs> no, that's fair. We uh, limit three drinks anyway. Oh, so good. Actually, speaking of, that might be the last, last call. Sign. Well, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Works out perfectly. Fill that up for you. Thank you. Absolutely. I do have another podcast. What's your pod- What's the other podcast? It's called Dos Pequeños, which is all about paranormal. It started out being about paranormal in New Mexico, but yeah. we've kind of opened it up to just paranormal stuff in general. Okay. Um, it's one of those things that for me is kind of a break from the true crime. Yeah, something yeah. a little more lighthearted. A and little fun. bit more lighthearted, I look, can get a little <laughs> dark sometimes, uh, but it is fun for me, and I, I love weird stuff like that. So. Have you ever gone on the ghost tours in Old Town? Not yet. Okay. I have. They are a blast. And if you, if you reserve it right, you can go at 10 o'clock at night. So then it's like pitch black. Oh yeah. It's spooky. It's really fun. I should do that. New Mexico is super haunted. It is. Incredibly haunted. It is. Although flimsily sometimes. Cause we, you know, every time we look at things, even Roswell seems a little flimsy when you just dig a little bit below the surface, you start to see these things and like Roswell aliens and everything. Yeah. And, and probably the New Mexico tourism board doesn't like me saying that, but, (laughs) um, you know, it, they're fun things to talk about and to look at. And I used to be super strong believer in paranormal mm-hmm. stuff, but as I started to actually research it and I try to, you know, apply the same level of research yeah. that I do for my other show, it, uh, it kind of quickly falls apart. I 100% do not believe in ghosts. Okay. And I think that comes with me being an atheist because if God isn't real, that means the devil isn't real. If those two aren't real, then afterlife isn't real. If afterlife isn't real, ghosts aren't real. That's like kind of like Do you my- believe in quantum physics? I don't know anything about enough to believe in that. The idea that energy never goes away. Oh, yeah, and matter is neither created nor forever. destroyed. Right. Yeah. And everything we see doesn't necessarily exist the way that we see it. I would, I, I'm tempted to believe in that. Okay. Absolutely. And I, it's not that I'm a full blown, like, there's no way that ghosts ever exist. It's sure. um, probably not type dealio. But I've also had what I would consider to be spiritual experiences with what I consider to be the divine, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever that energy is mm-hmm. that aren't quite so explainable sure and so i'm 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 willing to say maybe okay. that's where i'm at i'm willing to say maybe <laughs> See, and, and i went from like hardcore believer to willing to say maybe yeah. as well so i'm there too but i have had experiences that make me question everything that i know or think i know so and some of those experiences are very sacred right sure but do you have any that you'd be willing to share um sure okay so Sometimes I have dreams that come true. Like, I feel that. Okay. <laughs> and I completely understand that. So, um, one example was I had a dream that my mom, my dad, and I were in this really shitty hotel room and talking. And my parents separated when I was five and they didn't talk. They were not on speaking terms. Mm-hmm. And it was, I told my mom about it and she's like, that's never going to happen. I hate your dad. Like, yeah. I don't know why you're telling me about this dream. Um, And then I had this weird compulsion to find my uncle who I hadn't seen for like 15 years. 
and this was before the internet was what it is now. So I was relying a lot on like white pages yeah. in different cities, things like that. And I don't know, just one day I felt this really strong desire to see my uncle and I was working, I got home and there was a voicemail on my message machine. This was how long ago this was, <laughs> uh, that it was my dad telling me that my uncle was dying. And so I called my mom. My mom said, Hey, I'll go with you. Let's go say goodbye to your uncle. So we drive to Amarillo, Texas and we get there. My uncle had been in a coma. As soon as we walk in, he wakes up. It was the first time he'd waken up in yeah. weeks and he's crying, but he can't talk cause he's like intubated and everything. So we talked to him for a little while and then we go to our shitty motel and it was the same room, the same bedspread, the same carpet, the same wallpaper, same smell, same smell. Yeah. And it was, we were sitting in the same place where my dream was. It was crazy. So mm-hmm. those kinds of things make me believe that maybe there's more than what we can see. Yeah. I, I definitely believe in an eternity because, again, science truth is that mm-hmm. it matters neither created nor destroyed. Mm-hmm. Even if my eternity is just my going, me going to clay and becoming a tree or whatever, right. I'm still going to exist forever. Um, I've had very similar experiences. Mm-hmm. And at one point, a religious figure, in a religion that I no longer believe in, mind you, but a religious figure had told me that that was a sign that I was su- where I was supposed to be yeah. in this destiny of what is my life. Yeah. And it's, I think that was just a comforting way to look at it. Is that truly what that is? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that that's, when you have yeah. those kind of deja vu moments, for me, that's always a good mm-hmm. sign. I take that as a good yeah, sign. Yeah, where I'm like, okay, this is where this I, is fine. I need to be yeah. here for some reason. Yeah. yeah. I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, do I believe that my life is being planned every step of the way? No, I don't. I think mm-hmm. I have a lot of free will to do whatever yeah. I want. But there are certain things, you know, and like discovering podcasting and, and finding my voice and building this platform, it's become somewhat of a calling for me, you know, helping other people in my community. It's something that is super important to me that I didn't really even realize I needed until mm-hmm. I had it. Well said. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that once you have that creative outlet like podcasting, mm-hmm. um, it just feels right. And it feels mm-hmm. like you're, you're there. And then you get a little bit of a following and you're like, oh, I'm doing this. It feels great. <laughs> I can actually call myself a podcaster I know. Now. I, I'm a podcaster now. <laughs> darn it. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, would you consider yourself to be religious then? Spiritual? I think spiritual. Okay. You know, I, I meditate and, uh, and do stuff like that for my own mental health mostly mm-hmm. um, because it does help me to stay calm and to stay grounded and to focus on being present, which I think is something that's really important that is neglected in this so, culture. Yeah. When you say being present, what do you mean by that? Are you, I'm assuming you're talking about how, you know, living in the moment, yeah. making sure that I am here to take in what I have been presented this day or something Yeah, like right now, right? Yeah. Because really you, you think about a lot of anxiety comes from worrying about what could happen in the future or um, maybe some distress about what's happened in the past. Mm-hmm. And if you're fully in the moment, you really don't focus on those things because, you know, when the past happened, it was right now. And when the future happens, it's going to be right now. Yeah. So just hang out like right now. This is what matters. This is what's important. Or you'll miss a lot of what's going on in your life. And, you know, either worrying about the future or being really sad about the past, you, you really miss what's in front of you. And, um, I think it's important to just stay kind of in that lane. Mm -hmm. That's fair. There's that quote from, uh, Kung Fu Panda, which is a great movie. It's that, it's that turtle dude. He's like, yesterday is history, tomorrow's a mystery, but today is a gift. Mm-hmm. That is why it is called the present. That's right. There's a lot of wisdom in kids' movies because they have to dumb it down to like real simple, simple, simple things. Absolutely. On that subject, what's your favorite kids' animated movie? Oh. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say it's a kids' animated movie and probably not even really animated, but I would say The Mandalorian is probably my favorite Show. Animated ish mm-hmm. show. That's but it's fair. not really animated. <laughs> not really. It's 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 a show. <laughs> it's a show. Yeah. I don't I don't know. I've I, my kid is sixteen years old now, so I'm far okay. removed from kids' movies. I was gonna say you're you're on the level where you're talking like adult swim at this point. Yeah, you know what I mean? pretty much. How old are you? Because you seem very young, but you have a sixteen year old. Well, thank kid. you. I'm forty one. Okay. 
So old enough to have a 16 year old kid. That's fair. <laughs> Just old enough. <laughs> yeah. Do you have one kid or one kid? One kid. Okay, cool. Yeah. And he does go to school in, here in Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. What is your thoughts on his education here in Albuquerque? Well, he's been very fortunate to, to go to some really good schools okay. that, um, He's just lucky for, to have that. Yeah. Um, but I think that the education system definitely needs some work here. That probably um, keeps your side business going is the education system yeah. here because how bad it is. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's all it's all connected. It's all. It, it's funny because people think of of, of of an industry as a closed circuit, a closed system where mm-hmm. we are just the industry and that's it, right? But it's an open system where it has influence from everything. There's no. There's truly no such thing as a closed system. Mm-hmm. Even our entire earth is not a closed system because we're getting stuff coming in and we're actually shooting stuff out. You know what I mean? I think that that has a lot to do with our society, mm-hmm. you know, being very individually focused. Like we just, yeah, we yeah. talked about, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that makes us want everything in a nice, neat little box, mm-hmm. but that's not reality. The reality is very messy. Yeah. So assuming that people are going to come visit Albuquerque, mm-hmm. right? What are like the top five places you recommend them going? Assuming that they're definitely going to come here, they've heard about the crime, they don't give a shit, which is fair because I love it here and I live, I live here. It's fine. What are the top five places to visit in Albuquerque? Specifically? In Albuquerque, yeah. Well, my favorite restaurant, I'm going to regret saying this, uh, is Cervantes on Gibson and San Pedro. It okay. is the best New Mexican food. It's almost like your grandma's back there making. I food. heard some people in the bar be like, "Oh man, yeah, that's good yeah, stuff." It's, it's really good, and it's like kind of stuck in the '70s, you know. And every holiday, they decorate way overboard, which is also kind of fun and annoying at the same time. Yeah. Um, so that's my favorite restaurant in New Mexico. It's also, I think, the most underrated New Mexican restaurant. That's fair because everyone goes like Garcia's, or El Pinto, Lillas, El Pinto. Mm-hmm. Which are still good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay we have a true diehard fan i yeah, understand that. Yeah. um i haven't been there yet so i'll have to check it out okay. um that I, I gotta kick you out okay um so you can drink as much of that as you want you okay can leave it it's all good all right um but while while we're wrapping up here i want to tell you i have a podcast now it's called the let's have a drink podcast i'm also a podcaster nice yeah um we have bar conversations like this you can find us on youtube spotify apple music google music and even amazon music i think we're on all the the streaming the major platforms. ones, yeah. yeah. So feel free to check us out. Cool. I really appreciate you coming in today, man. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah, I appreciate you. Have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you again. You too. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.